are they going to keep doing this course? This course is a, yeah, every year it, it's been done, so it'll be somebody else. Yep. And the material is all going to stay online, though, so it's not going to disappear. The idea is to keep it. Whether or not I'm here or not, I'll be improving the notes mm -hmm. because I'm starting to use them a lot myself. All right, why don't we go ahead and get started? Uh, today we've got some announcements first. The first one is, you, most of you probably heard by now, I'm going to be going to Google to work on Oceans. I'll be a full-time GIS data engineer starting in January. So I'm with you for the rest of the semester. I'm not running off on you. So if you collect bathymetry, I want your bathymetry, but not till next summer or later. <laughs> yeah, send all your data to me and clobber me with your data. Does that mean you're going to be doing the Piscataqua? That means I will be trying to figure out how to do the Piscataqua. The inshore stuff isn't done yet, so there's lots and lots of it. And there's more data-wise, the shallower you are, the more data you can generate because you can ping faster. So the shallow stuff is the hard stuff. Plus then there's data issues and how do you blend it with the shore. If you look right now on Earth, there's usually a picture of some water between the bathymetry and the shore to kind of buffer that. So we'll be trying to work on that. And then I'll also be doing lots of vector and polygon type data sets. This just came out. I just saw this. The National Science Foundation, this is their sample and data policy. So it's a PDF that talks about their procedures for what you're supposed to do with your data. We've linked to, in this class, the NOAA versions of that, and we've talked a little bit about that. Not nearly as much as I would like, but here's a link to the document that's from NSF talking about how they think you should work with data. I did no more than just sort of skim it, but it's probably a good pointer and at least a good start in vocabulary in terms of managing data sets. Another thing I wanted to point out to you guys that I didn't hear until way, way into my career, and I think it's really important, is the RV Tech Group. This stands for Research Vessel Technicians. These are people who work on ships all over the world and might also be people on the mailing list who are also working on shore and don't actually get to go to sea, but it's people who all care about the workings of ships, and it covers everything from people trying to figure out what kind of winch line to put on their CTD or how to do welding on the ship or how to manage the data systems. And they have a conference once a year, and it's actually this week. A lot of us are unfortunately missing it, but there's some really great discussions about managing data, processing, multi-beam. And on their website, I've given you a couple of links to things that I think are interesting. They have this document depot, which has got some very helpful documents that you may use in your classes as background material for some of the things that you guys will be studying. So it's important to know about this group. They have a mailing list, and if you get really stuck when, you're, when you've graduated and you're out at sea and you need help figuring something out, this is a great bunch of folks who like to answer other people's questions. Another one I wanted to point out to you is, uh, another link, is the FOSS4G is the free open source software conference on geospatial. So that number four means the word F-O-R in English. These are geospatial people. And they have a conference every year. It's been all over the world. It's been in, uh, I think it was Spain or Portugal last year. This year it was in Denver. Next year it's somewhere in Asia, I think. The videos from this year have just gone up. So if you're interested in more of these topics, and I just gave you a direct link to one of them. Frank Warmerdam is the lead author for GDAL, the Geospatial Data Abstraction Library we've been using. And he gave a talk about performance and speed on GDAL with rasters. So when you start getting big data sets, when we're working here on the virtual machine, we're always picking fairly easy problems that don't clobber the virtual machine because we're trying to spend our time learning, not waiting for the computer to finish. He's been looking at how do you deal with big images. And so his test image is 16K by 16K cells. And he was trying to figure out how to read that the fastest. So there's some interesting things in there. So there's a lot going on out there. There's tons of tools that we haven't talked about in here. I just want to give you a sense that there's more than just what's going on here. And it's a big community. There's a lot of people who are very excited to talk to beginners and experts alike. I threw a C also to go for it with last time and this time. If you guys are feeling uncomfortable with bits, bytes, doubles, and floats, and integers, I threw up three YouTube videos that I thought gave you at least a sense of if you're wondering about bits and bytes and you want a, a better discussion of them, these people actually take some serious time to go through and it's about 30 minutes and they talk about bits and bytes in pretty big detail and they show you a lot of examples. The first one is very polished. It actually is pretty good, I think. And then these other two are definitely not polished, but I think they're good. Despite the fact that Wikipedia isn't a great academic source, it's 
there are some really great articles on Wikipedia about particular equations and math techniques and computer science terminology. So I threw in the integer, the floating point, and the binary number system pages. I think they're actually pretty good references. So those are there if you uh, feel like you need more. But let's jump into a new topic. Ben, do you have the book with you? So we're going to cover the topic that's in the book that Ben's holding up here. It's called Mercurial. And we're going to just dip our toe in the pond. We're not going to try it too hard. We're going to just start off and see it once, and then we're going to get into it more down the road. And it's called Mercurial, which is one of the many version control systems. So if you've seen track changes in Word, track changes in Word is directly copied from version control systems, and it's, it's not as powerful as some of the things you'll see here. It's about taking your documents and managing the changes, keeping track of why and how and when things changed, and being able to have diverging ideas. Like if two of you are working on a project together, you might have a different idea of how to approach it. And you might split off from each other for a little bit, take your own approaches, and then come back. And how do you then get your two, two ideas to come back together and join into one final project? This kind of tool is designed for exactly that. Now today, we're not going to use it for very much. We're just going to use a small bit of its capability. But hopefully, it'll give you a sense that it can, parts of it are fairly easy. And there are parts in there that will definitely turn your mind around a few times as you try to figure out how to blend two people's work together where they've you know, been working separately for a month or two. It, that's not easy, no matter what the tool is. But here, we're going to use it to pull down the notes for class. And we'll use them from now on to keep the notes from class on your virtual machine up to date. And so what you can do is, once you've got it set up, all you have to do is go into the directory where the notes are, and there's one command to update those notes to the latest version, to get the latest class. And you don't have to worry about running around and getting a wget or a curl to find some file or do a download in, in a web browser. The idea here is that it knows where they come from. It knows their history. And you can say, please just get the latest version and make, make my world all, all good. So we're going to go ahead and pull the notes onto your machines now. This section we will do only today. And then it will be ready to go on your computers from now on. And then I'll put the command in each class that updates to get the latest version, so then you'll get the new stuff. Is there something about this on the PCOM wiki? There, there most certainly is some information on Mercurial. So we used to use something called Subversion, or SVN. And a lot of people in this building have Subversion repositories where they keep their stuff. And CCOM is trying to transition to Mercurial. And there, that's a great question, because that reminds me to say that there's lots of different version control tools. Subversion is great if you're on land with good internet all the time. Mercurial and Git are two new ones that are designed such that you don't have to have internet all the time. It's OK to be at sea and to make changes and check them in, because you check them in locally. And then you can have multiple repositories that then synchronize together. So when you get back to an internet connection, you could then push to, say, the CCOM repository from your local setup. And that means that you can track changes as you go at sea without internet, whereas with Subversion, we have people who come back. They've done a month's worth of changes. That could be 10,000 lines of code and five or 10,000 lines of text that they've written at sea. And they have one big change where it all goes in. It might be something on biology, something on their thesis, something on you know, some other notes, something about administration. You know, it's just totally unrelated. But they go in as one giant change. And the, the thing about these things is it's great to be able to track the why did I make that change. So when you go back six months later and you say, you know, this isn't working out, and you go read, oh, yeah, that's why I made this decision. And that's actually tracked in here. So we'll see some of that. And I think you'll hopefully start liking it. Some of this is just sort of my habits, too. And I'll try and explain those. So I tend to make a directory called projects. And I check things out under projects. So I kind of have a sense that those are version controlled things. We'll make a directory called projects. I'll just do clear. Get rid of that stuff. OK. So make dir projects. We'll go into projects. In case you don't have it on your machines, you can do this command here to install Mercurial, which is also known by the, the very similar word Mercury. And the symbol for it is hg. So we'll say sudo apt get install Mercurial. And for me, it's already been installed. I think it's installed on all of your machines. And now we can say hg clone. And clone means go out, grab a repository, and clone it to your local disk. It's like Dolly the uh, Sheep, was it? Yeah, so you're cloning. All right, so I'm just going to copy that URL in. 
And I'll show you in a minute where you can get this command. So if we hit enter, you're going to get a bunch of warnings about certificates. That's SSL troubles, not a big deal. And then it's checked out stuff. And if you do an ls-la in that directory, so what we've got now is a research tools directory. I have a tree command written over here. So we'll just say tree research tools. And you'll see kind of a graphical representation of what's in there. And so you'll see all the class notes are actually hiding in here. And if you run the update command, if there's new files in there, they'll just appear. It handles the managing of those files for you, so you don't have to worry about them. So if we went into research tools and then class, do an ls-l, we have way too much stuff, but then we could say less 22 Python. So just 22 and then tab. And we're now looking at today's notes. So they're not sitting where we want them, but we'll just leave them here and we'll copy them from this location into our working area to work with them today. I'm also going to type history so you can take a quick peek through what I've done. So we started off doing the make dir projects. We went CD into projects. We installed Mercurial. We did this thing called clone with Mercurial. One of the reasons that I got to go fast here was I copied that URL. If you have to type that in, it's pretty slow to type. I took a look around. I did a tree, which shows you the file structure underneath the little area with a funky little graphical form. And then I went in there, took a look. I cd'd into research tools slash class. And then I did an ls and then a less of that file. No so such file or directory. OK, so do a control U. OK, so you're in projects. Do an ls dash L. And we'll see what you've got in your directory. Let's take a look here. So you're in projects, research tool projects. So yeah, I think you've gone through it twice. So backup, do a cd dot dot. We'll go up one directory. Now do an ls dash L. And now you've got class general. So you can go into class, and there should be all those files. So now we're going to scroll down just a little bit to the setup section. So first we'll do a cd just to go back to your home directory. So if I do a pwd, I'm in home research tools. We'll cd into projects, and then cd into research tools. So I'm in this directory. And the Mercurial command to update and get the latest files is it's called pull. So the first one you did was clone, was clone that repository over to this, this computer. And now you're going to do a pull to grab the latest changes. So you just say hg and then the, the word pull. What would have changed since we downloaded it? If I was somehow sneaking off to another computer, some stuff could have changed. Uh, hopefully it should say that nothing has changed or there might be a hacker in my account or something. <laughs> but we're just doing that so you see the command. And then we're going to run the hgpull command every time you come to class. You run that command, you'll get the latest version. The thing this will allow me to do is if in class there's some critical problem, I could quick fix it. I could push those changes up to the server. And then we could then grab them back and try them. So I'm going to hit the hgpull and press Enter. You're going to see two warnings. These are SSL warnings that you need to ignore. They're really kind of annoying. But these two lines right here where it says, searching for changes, no changes found. We're not surprised because I haven't been editing this file while we're doing it. I'm going to go jump to a web browser. And you guys can just follow along. You can either follow along with a web browser, or you can just watch. Not a big deal. So if I make changes to your structure, and I don't upload them, when I re-download them, it's going to overwrite them? It's going to give you a conflict. It's going to say, I don't know what to do. Until you deal with this, I'm just going to sit here and say no. So I'm going to open up a new tab here and paste in that URL. So this is a website, Bitbucket. There's a whole bunch of companies that work to provide reversion control repositories for you. There's also one here at CCOM that you can use. You can use several, one, or none of them, depending on what you feel like doing. A lot of them have free accounts, and so that's what I'm doing here. If you do open source code and your project isn't huge, like I'm not going to be checking in the audio and video files for this class in here because then they would make me pay a lot of money because those are huge files. But if we go here, Bitbucket, this company has said, you know what, we'll let you go ahead and have free accounts where you can store stuff in your repository. And there's lots of things you'll be able to do with these websites. We could share you. If you guys find a mistake in my code, there's a way that I'll show you guys later on to send me the fix. And then I can review it. It's called a pull request. And then I can say, yep, I like it. Or no, I reject it. But here's what I would do instead. So it's got a whole lot of collaboration tools. 
It has recent commits. So you can see me working on class 34 minutes ago, two hours ago, four hours ago. And each of these revisions, we can click on a particular one. Uh, let's see, we'll say minor cleanup, this guy. And in there, it'll actually have highlighted what I've changed. And so there's a, usually a comment, I believe it's still new to Bitbucket. I've been using something called GitHub instead. It's just another service. It'll show you colored, the things I've added. So everything in green, but you can see here, I was trying to figure out org mode like to turn some of my text into a footnote. And I wasn't trying to write a footnote. I was trying to write what IPython was saying. And you can see what I was changing. Like here I found a bug where I created a source block and I forgot to say the source block was Python. And when I tried to export it, it said, uh, your source block is messed up. I don't know what to color it as, so go fix it. And so you can see all of my changes over time and you can go back to different versions. You can comment on it. You can tell me that my revision sucked or it was good or you know, you'd rather see something else. And there's all kinds of different things that you can do. You can follow it so you can get a notice whenever something's changed. That command that you ran with the hg clone to get it onto your computer, they put that on every single page. So if you run that command in a terminal on a different computer, you'll grab the same repository into your local machine. I don't expect at this point that you have a good feel for what Mercurial is. But for now, you'll at least see the, if there's a project out there that you want to work with and you want to get the latest version of it and it has a repository like this, you can run a command to grab that repository and then you'll be able to update and follow along with the people who are building it. What, what, so like, like what constitutes a repository? Anything you want or like what's good practice? What's good practice? That's a really good question. There's probably lots of thoughts that vary all over the place on that. If you think about some of the open source projects, they tend to be an individual project. I've seen people who stick all of the work that they do across all sorts of different topics into one giant repository and they have a directory underneath that for each one. I've seen people who have hundreds of little individual repositories and like each one is a thought. I kind of think that's a little annoying, but you know, it really is your own personal preference and who you're working with. If it's on your own, you have total flexibility to decide what you think is good, and that's sometimes tough. If you're working in a group, oftentimes the group decides what's a reasonable thing. So if you're working on some topic with a consistent set of people, that might be a repository. The other thing that we might do sometimes is split off the big files because they take a long time to update and they get really frustrating. Roland and I tried to put six gigabytes of images and models and whatnot from GeoZooey into a repository once. And hours later, we decided that that was really a bad idea. It was still grinding away on the upload and the download took almost as long too. It just was really frustrating. So sometimes splitting it in terms of size, organization, each of the books on these topics usually give you some sort of sense. And I kind of think it shouldn't be too huge and it should be a sort of logical thought. It's something you gotta try and see. So for me, this class, all the org mode notes and Unfortunately, none the examples are too big, so I've not put them in this repository. So you can see the decision I've made with this class. It's just going to be the notes for the classes, the videos, and then the separate org files that I've written outside of class. Tough question, and I didn't give you a very good solid answer because I don't think there really is one. It's a tool that can be used in all sorts of different ways, too. You could put big files on it locally with this one, and it might work, unlike Subversion, which had to go to an external server, which is why the six gigabytes took us forever. Kill that web page. And let's go do some more SBET processing. I'm going to CD back to the home directory. We're going to make dir dash p tilde slash class 22. Press enter. And you're going to CD into tilde slash class 22. Hit, and I'm just hitting enter a few times to kind of break things up a little bit. And type pwd and make sure that you see this path. In that directory, we're going to go ahead and grab, first we're going to grab locally the org mode file that we had. So I'll do copy tilde slash projects, research tools, so RE tab, class, 22 tab, and there's our org file, and period for the current directory. Press enter. Now if you do an ls, you'll see we have just an org file in there. Since it's not in the repository, we'll just go ahead and grab, using a curl command again, the SBET example that we have, and we'll uncompress it. Do edit, copy, edit, paste. And so now if we do an ls-l, and we should see here we have our org file, and we have our sample SBET. 
And feel free to run the MD5 sum again just to make sure that we have the right file. MD5 sum. And it looks like I have the sample file. Being that it's me, I didn't go and change things between the last class and now. If you have Emacs started, a great way to make sure that you have the right org file open in the right location is we can say Emacs client dash dash no dash wait and then 22 tab. And this is going to tell Emacs, please go start up that file editing in this directory. I know a couple of you still have a problem with not having your .emacs file totally correct that we haven't solved yet. For you, you're going to have to do a control X, control F and open the file and go CD into class 22. But if you, if you have it working and you hit enter here, your Emacs should say class 22 and we should be good to go. I'm going to jump down in the org file using control S and I'm going to say IPython and that'll get me down to start IPython in a terminal. So at this point I'm going to hide Firefox. I'm not going to use it anymore. And we'll be just doing IPython in the terminal plus we'll go ahead and type clear just to hide everything because it's getting noisy and we'll type ipython hit enter and now we're going to go and do that log start again so we can keep a journal of what's going on so we'll say log start dash o dash r log dash class class 22 dot pi press enter and now we have a log file if you do an ls dash l you'll see that you have a log class 22 pi so we're going to definitely use these three modules today, or at least two of them. So we'll say import struct, import numpy, and import math. So we've got those ready to go. We're going to play a little bit with the file directly in IPython. So we did last time sbet underscore file equals open sam tab. So you get your sample dot sbet and then hit enter. And sbet data equals sbet file.read and two parentheses. Now I'm going to type history in a second so you can see the whole list of commands. So I'll type history and you can see one through eight of the commands we've done so far. Awesome. That's really unfun. No attribute right. Type exit in then two parentheses. Yep, enter. Uh, control D. Well, that is really weird. Uh, I to exit, definitely. We want out of this. That's definitely broken. So type IPython. Do you guys remember the whos command? Go ahead and type whos and see, make sure you got all your variables in there. Do a PWD. Print your working directory. Press enter. Can you close that window? Just click the orange X on your terminal. Just let's get rid of that. Yeah, just kill it. I would say reboot the virtual machine completely. Yeah with the power button, or you may have to kill it, and you're going to have to work on catching up because there's something really weird in that. So if we do whose, we see that we've got our really horrible looking data that we're going to use struct to parse. And we were working on building a function that's going to load up this data. One of the things I love when you guys do is when you ask me questions outside of class that tell me that I'm not covering something well enough. And so you guys have done that, and I'm going to go back through functions again and make sure that you guys have a good sense of how arguments and parameters are passed into functions. So we'll give it another go, and I hope that helps. So we're going to go through these notes. We did the who's, and we're going to be in a section functions and arguments. And I've given you links to a couple, two web pages that I think are OK, and a YouTube video, which it, it definitely works to go through in a slightly different style. And we're going to create a file called sonar.py. It's not going to be very exciting, and we're going to pretend to set the frequency of a sonar. We're going to create this file as a simple function, and we're just going to work through argument passing a little bit. And I think this will help you guys make sure that you've got argument passing. I'm going to split this, control X2, and I'm going to do a control X, control F. And so I'm in class 22, and I'm going to type sonar.py, press enter. So now I've got my sonar.py file that we're going to work on right in here. It has the, please write this in it. So we're going to create our first function. So def is the beginning of defining a function. The function name is going to be set frequency, two parentheses, and then a colon. And this is the first line that defines a function. And for all functions, it's going to be very similar. You'll change the name, and later on we'll see what we put in the parentheses. Inside that function, 
we'll say print setting frequency, and then we'll put a comment, write code here to set the frequency. We are not going to write that code because we have no sonar to talk to, but I figured an example that's very similar to something that you might actually have to do is a little helpful. Save that, control X, control S. We're going to run that script. So if we go into our IPython terminal, type ls, we should see sonar.py. And IPython has that run command with you, so run sonar. Anybody think they know what's going to happen? What the output might be? No argument or something. I heard one nothing. I heard no argument. Yep, we're, we actually never call the function. So I'm guessing we're going to see nothing. And it runs. At least it doesn't give us an error. But sometimes that could be as frustrating as an error message or more frustrating because you don't know what happened. And the trick is we need to call our function so we can actually use it. So if you scroll on a little bit, I have the example of how to do that. And I'm going to also add a little bit of documentation just for help. So define or create the function. So def is just short for define. And then we're going to call that function. So set frequency, two parentheses, and then save it with control X, control S. And let's rerun that. So it says setting frequency. All right, so now we've got a, a function call. So it's very similar syntax between the call right here and the definition. You just have the extra def and then the colon saying start it. If we want to set this frequency, we want to be able to set a particular number, we need to have an argument we can pass in into the function. So in our function name, we need to be able to go in here and pass in something that goes in the, these two parentheses that's going to be our variable that we then use in here to set the frequency. So what we can do is say freq for our variable name, or freq, and then we'll add some very important code here that really sets the frequency, not really. We'll at least use that variable to print out what our frequency would be that we're trying to set. So let's go ahead and save this. Control X, Control S. The key thing here is that that frequency variable is local to the function. FREQ has nothing to do with anything outside of that function. It doesn't exist anywhere else. And let's try running that and see what happens. And we get a really nice error message saying <laughs> no. Now, the trouble is, is that we now have a parameter or uh, argument to our function that we haven't called it with anything in here. So we're trying to call a function that needs some data. We're not giving it anything, so it's upset. In Python, there's a really nice feature that if you know the default value or the most common value that's going to be used in a function, you can set that as a default value inside of this parameter. So perhaps a very common frequency for sonars in deep water is 12 kilohertz. This is not your shallow water sonar. But if we have a, a 12 kilohertz sonar, we can set that to be our default. And we can try running this again. And what's going to happen is when it comes through here, there's no argument in here. It says, OK, we're going to take that default, and we're going to use it inside. So we should see that this print right here is going to take that default value and print it out. So let's hit Run again. And now we have setting frequency 12,000. And I'm going to do something that isn't in the notes because we should always write our units, and I didn't, and that was bad. So now we'll at least put a hertz on there. So that gives you at least a default value, but what if we want to go and set it ourselves? What we then need to do is we pass in a parameter. So you guys have been doing this a lot. I'm just trying to be extra explicit. So now that you've done it for a few weeks, now you're going to see it again. Hopefully that'll reinforce the idea of passing in parameters. So what if we want a 24 kilohertz or 24,000 hertz sonar? We'll save that and try it again. So what this will do is say, pass in a parameter. Since this is the first number, it gets assigned to the first value. And that 24,000 will go in to the frequency variable, the FREQ. We'll say run. And it now says setting frequency 24,000 hertz. So we've now successfully passed in a parameter. Now what if we want to use that from a variable? So this will actually show us that variables exist in different spaces. And what if I say my sonar frequency, FREQ, equals 15 kilohertz, or 15,000. And we'll pass in my sonar FREQ frequency. Save that. And this basically takes a variable name. And the name that exists out here that you're using as a parameter doesn't have to be the same name 
as what's inside here. What matters is the position. It matches up the first argument to the first variable that you put in your definition. So give that a run, run sonar, and you should see where this is very exciting. We've set our sonar to a couple different frequencies here. One last thing to sort of show the, the power of being able to pass arguments around and do some fun things is you can do things like create a table of values that you might want to use. Say you had a list of sonars and you knew all their frequencies. We could create a little uh, dictionary that's got all the possible values. So we could say sonar frequency or freak table equals left curly braces, start a dictionary, right curly braces, end a dictionary. And then we have key and value inside. So we could say EM122, which is a Kongsberg sonar, 12,000, comma, and then a Newton, which is a, typically a sub-bottom profiler or a single beam. It's a single beam uh, sub-bottom or chirp or CW pulse. And that, one of the frequencies that's often used with that is 3.5 kilohertz. Or, and then when we call this, we can say sonar freak table. And then we can just say, in quotes, Newton. And Newton is pronounced like it has no K, but it does. So here we've done a lookup of Newton on our frequency table. And while we all might remember that number, we might use it so often that we feel it's no big deal. If you start going through someone else's code and they've got like 12,000 here and 3.5 there, you don't know what they meant and what they were intending on that code. So this way, you know that someone was trying to set the frequency to be the frequency that's the default for a Newton. So you're trying to oftentimes with your code communicate more than just the actual number. You're trying to communicate the reason and the meaning behind them. So we'll run that one and it writes out 3,500 hertz. So that's just a quick review of functions. We can also do one example I missed would be having a second parameter. Things that are coming into your script, we're going to aim for that uh, down the road in this series of with SBETs. We're going to, I don't have any other SBETs prepared, but if we get there, we'll just copy our SBET and do it like three times or something. Mm -hmm. But we'll be able to pass things through. And so what you do is you write a, a set of functions that handle a file name, and then outside of that, you'll walk through a bunch of file names. So we're going to aim, we're aiming to get there. So if we had a second variable that might be name equals unknown as our default, name is name. So then we could pass in a second variable. We could say RV super slow. So what it's going to do is it's going to match up our first input argument with the first variable in our definition. And the second one will get matched up to the second one. So that way you can have multiple ones and they just match up one to one. We'll hit run. And so setting frequency 35's name is RV super slow. So that's a quick reminder of functions. Don't feel like you, it's not OK to go back and reread on this. If you haven't done it for a couple weeks or months and you come back to this, grab those references and read back through them and read up on the definitions of how to create a function. Repetition is the key to getting good at this. So that gets us back to where we were last time. And let's go back to creating an sbet.py file. Failing to execute file, yes. Syntax error. Do um, you see where it's got the look up here? See how here it's got this little caret? So if you have a syntax error in your code and it's giving you a syntax error traceback where it says invalid syntax, it puts a little up hat. It looks like a little tri uh, arrow pointing up right at your error if it can. And so here you have an extra parenthesis in here. So between, see how this parenthesis here, it matches that parenthesis over there. You have an extra one inside. So what we have here in our argument list, so you have your left parenthesis that starts it right here. Then you have a variable, 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 and so forth, separated by commas, and then you end it with a parenthesis over here. So if you have a parenthesis tucked in here, that was the error that you ran into. So it's a comma separated list of parameters. So let's open up sbet.py and get back into our sbets. Hopefully you feel a little more comfortable with functions. sbet.py. And we're going to go back to 
where we were, and I'll just start typing it. I'm not going to paste in, so I actually go slow enough that you can follow along. I had a comment at the top, so decode a planix pause pack. So we're writing a new one, or we're opening the one from last month? We're, we're starting over for the new one. I'm going to get you back to where we were, so that you walk through it, and hopefully that helps you remember a little bit, rather than just copying the old file. It's good to go back through it when you're starting out. So decode a Planix pause pack sbet IMU binary files is our first comment. We're going to create a function called decode. So def decode. And we passed it a data parameter. And we had our documentation string that was decipher a sbet datagram from binary and print the length of that, so data length colon len left parenthesis data. So that's our first function where we were. Doesn't do much other than print the length of the data that you pass in. And then we had a main function, so def main. And this one doesn't take any parameters, just like the one that we were starting off with before. Print starting main in quotes. Then we're going to do just like we did before, opening our sbet file. So sbet file equals open sample.sbet and sbet data equals sbet underscore file dot read and two parentheses. Is there a mode, is there a tab mode? Mm -hmm. not, so, the, so if you have an sbet underscore file, that tab would automatically populate? Oh, you want autocomplete on the variable names? Where like, like if, yeah, is there, a way to do that? there, I've definitely seen people who have it set up. Okay. Uh, it's a little complicated to get it set up effectively. Gotcha. I was gotcha. trying to avoid extra complication. Gotcha. Uh, not just snippets. Like Yaw snippets is awesome, but there's also okay. one that that'll parse your variable names and let you autocomplete. Oh. Um, I Python is part of that solution, or at least one of them. We did a scan, like, so before we had some stuff that knows about it, but we're going to just type it out and hopefully you'll get faster at typing. <laughs> so then we had some checking code where we did print read this many bytes, len sbet data. So just like inside of our of our decode function. These are just sort of placeholders that make sure that we're doing the right thing. Then we're going to call decode and we'll pass it in our sbet data and then print finishing main. So again, I have a print at the beginning and end of my functions, not because you want that in your you know, final version of your code, but when you're debugging, it's really nice to see entering and exiting of each function so that you can follow the path without having to open up what's called a debugger and really dig into the details of, of everything. So prints can often just make life really easy for, for debugging. Let's go ahead and give that a go. So we're going to we'll say import sbet. You should now have your sbet file loaded up. We should say sbet period. I'm going to hit tab. So you're going to see all the different things that are running around for that. And we have a decode and a main. Yes, question? Um, yeah, when we were just doing the last function, uh, I was trying to get back to this where you can hit period and then tab, and I don't think it had that. We didn't import it. Oh, okay. If I hadn't imported, if I say del sbet, so who's, and there's no sbet in there anymore, and I say sbet tab, you'll see the files that are yeah. there and the, the, the variables. If I say dot, all it's going to let you, you probably saw a complete to yeah. pi. Yeah, so you have to have that imported. So import sbet. And it's going to look at all the things that could be sbet period. Mm -hmm. And one of those is the module that we've imported. And there it is. So we can say decode, two parentheses. And it gets upset at us because we have no arguments passed in. So we could say sbet data. And it returns us the length of that. If we look up at our decode function, it just prints the length of that variable, which is our binary GUI data. Now remember, once you've imported, if you want to make a change and reload that, you use reload, not import. So you'd say reload sbet. And that updates from that source code that you've changed. 
let's try the main too. So sbet dot main, and this one will actually go load a file and do all everything for us. So that's actually going to follow what's in here. So it's going to open the file, read it, print out, and then call decode for us. So it looks like it's working. So it's time to actually do more than that because we've just loaded up a file, we have the data. Let's go back and grab that struct stuff that we did last time and we'll start decoding messages. So we're heading towards being able to load up one or more SBETs and we want to turn them into a plot of the ship track for this ship. That's our target. So let's go up to our code here and we're going to add two modules that we're going to use. We'll say import struct. Just because you did it in IPython, that doesn't mean you can get away from it in your Python script. Oh, yes. So you want to know if you can put decode or main first. Does it matter? In this case, there's no, since it's not using anything special in either one, but typically they can be in any order you want. So if you like your mains at top, which some people do, you're welcome to do that. My mains tend to sit at the bottom of the file just out of, I'm not sure why, old, old habits. So import struct, import math, since we're gonna eventually wanna do some uh, degrees to radians and radians to degrees. And let's go work on our decode function. So the first thing we're gonna wanna do is we unpacked it before. So values equals struct dot unpack right out of the last lecture, 17D. So we're unpacking 17 doubles. Remember, we had 17 variables. They were all of type double, eight bytes. And then we need to grab the right length of data off of our data block. If we give it the wrong size, it's gonna complain. And the size of that was gonna be eight times 17. So eight bytes per double and 17 of them. So we'll say data zero colon eight times 17. So you're allowed to do math any, almost anywhere. And if you wanna know what eight times 17 is, I'll just rather than do it in my head, eight times 17. Python works as a nice little calculator. And then we want to start, if you noticed, when I hit enter here, it didn't put me back where I thought I would be, back over at values. So this is a nice indication that something is not going on. I screwed up something. And what I missed was a right parenthesis. And you can see it does matching when, I, when you type it. It jumps back to where it closes. Or if you put the cursor on it, if you have the right mode set, it will jump back and highlight that. I don't have that turned on right now. After like a little period of time, it will... No, it does it right away if you have that mode turned on. It's one of the... Here we go. Paren match highlighting. So I think if we do... If you guys want, I can leave that on. Is that helpful? Yeah. Okay. And then we're going to say print type of values. So we'll just... For grins, we'll see what we get back. So type values. This is hopefully going to tell us it's a list of values coming back. And print contents of values. And most variables, if you pass them to print, get automatically turned into a string. It might not always be the way you want to look at it. It might be horrible looking, but at least it will print something out. So we can just say values. And now we have, hopefully, a list of 17 items. And we can then pull out the ones we know. This is time is position 0 different color. So we have, this is 0, 1, 2, 3, and this down here should be 16. So we can grab them by number. So we can say time equals values 0, and latitude was in position 1 up there. So latitude equals values sub 1, and Last time we also used uh, radians to degrees to convert these annoying radians around the Earth into something we could understand. So let's do that. Lat deg for degrees equals math dot degrees latitude. And getting tired of typing, longitude equals values. And that was in the second position by that table up there on the whiteboard. And lon underscore deg for degrees equals math dot degrees longitude. Getting close here, and then we want to print out some results. So we'll say print results colon comma time comma lat degrees lat degrees long degrees. Just watch out that that's y comma x. Save that. We'll just say reload 
sbet and sbet.main. And you should see all that printout, which is really annoying. It's kind of gross. And what happened is we printed that list out, which was right in here. And so it dumped out the 0 through 16 positions inside of one packet. And we have our weird timestamp, and we have our radians around the Earth that are hard to interpret. Turns out it didn't return what I thought. I thought it would be a list. It's a tuple. Tuples and lists work very similar in most cases if you're not trying to write to them. So we have a basic function that's at least decoding a packet now. There's lots of them in this file, but we're, we're starting to get there. And if you look at our results, we have our strange timestamp, which is in some units I'm unsure of. It's seconds, but based starting where, I don't know. It's the seconds in the Seconds of the... Seconds from the GPS week. Seconds from the GPS week. Lovely. Just what I always wanted. <laughs> <laughs> Assuming you know what week you're in. That's painful. So here's our, our latitude, so how far north we are. And here's our negative longitude, which is showing that we're way west, somewhere over in Alaska. And that came from the negative 2.5. So yeah, so the w minus 146 came from the minus 2.5, yep, in that position 2. So let's turn this into a script that we can run in several different ways more effectively, because having to always go in and remember which function you're going to call is kind of annoying. It could be main, you could call it whatever, but let's turn this into a real function. So the first thing I'm going to do is go down to the bottom, escape or meta, and then greater than. Go down to the bottom of the file. And we've done this before. We're going to use this if name is main. And that says, if this is being run as a script, we're going to go ahead and call the main function for you. So if underscore underscore name underscore underscore equals with two equal signs, single quotes underscore underscore main underscore, underscore, lots of underscores today, colon, and then print starting to run script. Then we'll call main and print script done. Go ahead and save that. So go up to the top of the file, and we need to add that line that we had before, pound, bang, user bin, env, python. So that says, if this gets run, start a Python interpreter and go ahead and do that. Now we need to tell this thing to become executable. So if we do an ls-l in here, we're going to see that our uh, sbet.py, which is right here, it's rwrr, which means read, write, read, and read. There's no execute set anywhere on this file, so we need to make it executable. So we're going to use that crazy Unix command chmod to make it executable. So we'll do exclamation point or bang, chmod plus x, which says, please turn on the execute bit, sbet.py. Press enter, do an ls-l, and take a look at the difference between, so here's our before, and here's our after. So we've got a couple changes. There's x's over here on the left for the permissions. And there's a little star over here saying it's marked with a star for executable. So I think it's time to try and run it. So first we'll say exclamation point to start a shell script and sbet.py. Press enter and it should work great. It'll be all done. No. Oops. Not slash. Exactly. So in here it says, here's a nice error message saved for us for <coughs> posterity. Oops, we need to tell bash where the program is located dot slash means the current directory. So if we go up and we edit that, bang dot slash sbet.py, press enter, cross our fingers, and you should see a script running. Can you explain why the dot slash is necessary? I can try. Dot is the current directory, and so you can either say slash at the beginning, and that gives you the root of the file system. So if you just have slash and then stuff, that's going to be relative to the top of your disk. Period is your current directory, so full stop. And then a slash means current directory, and then start doing directories off of where you are right now. And since we don't have any subdirectories, it's just going to be Why doesn't it just SBET. Why do you have to tell it what directory it's in? Because you're already in that directory. Excellent question. That's, that's Thank important. you. That's question Perfect. So what happens is, is that it has a path where it's going to search for stuff. And it's, it's always going to look in places like 
slash usr slash bin is the most common place for programs. And if you remember the type command, there's type and there was type dash a for search everywhere. And it searched in your path. And our path is very carefully set up not to be the current directory for security reasons. A classic way that people would hack computers before would put programs like ls that, are, that aren't actually ls but actually hack your computer in a directory and then wait till you went into that directory and did an ls and then it would take over your computer. It's happened so many times, it's painful. And so they've just decided as an entire community of Linux in installations that the current directory is not in your path. So it's a general security decision not to have that. So you always have to say dot slash if you said, I really want to run this program from the current directory. Because it is so easy to take over a computer that way and hack it. So we, we want hackers to stay away. We want good programmers, but not, not the folks who are trying to crack into things and be bad. Great question. We can either do dot slash. So this runs it through a shell script. Or remember that we can say run sbet.py from the IPython interpreter and it will do the same thing. It's just a question of do you go out and ask Bash to go find it or do you ask IPython to get it? Can I run the same line Windows? If you're in IPython on Windows, you can, run, you can use run. Um, the bang may or may not work depending on the way Python is set up for you. There might not be a Bash to go find. I don't know. I, there's probably lots of different ways that's handled and it may be handled by default. I'm not a Windows user, so you're on your own in terms of finding that out. And there's a couple people in the building, like uh, Val Schmidt has done stuff like that, so you might ask him. Or actually, Jordan's also a good resource, too. All right, so we've got a running script, and we need to start improving it. If you remember last time, and I'm going to copy this because I will most certainly make a typo here, we're going to copy the field names, so it's, the, it's all of these names in order, such that we can use that weird dict and zip trick that I suggest you just stick it in a note file and then you just copy and paste it. So we're going to put that variable up here. So we've got field names in there and we're going to modify our decode. So it's still going to have the values equals, but what we want to add right after that, so we're just going to, let's kill everything. So I'm going to do a control space on the line that has the print type of values, scroll down. So we're going to highlight that section from this print to that print, control W, it's gone. I'm going to say goodbye to it. Control X2, control X, and then just a B to get back to my buffer. And we're going to now use this line right here. So we'll say sbet values equals dict zip field names values. So hopefully you remember from last time that this built a dictionary that has all of these names in it as the key, and then all the values that we wanted to go with it all set up. And so it doesn't take me forever to type. I'm going to copy the lat long degrees. We need to save those keys into our dictionary so we've got our nice in degrees rather than radians values. So we've said sbet underscore values lat degrees equals math dot degrees sbet values longitude. So now rather than referring them to them by number, do you really want to remember that the Position two of S bets is latitude or longitude, or I guess it's longitude. I don't want to remember that. So now we can call them by name, and we can say print results colon, and then we could just print out the dictionary, but that's going to make a mess. Let's try and make it a little bit prettier. We can say for key in S bet values. If you loop over a dictionary, it's going to take all the keys out one by one. The order, I don't know, it could be any order, but at least they'll come out one by one and we can print them out one on each line. A couple spaces in there first, and then key, comma, sbet, values, and then we'll use the key to look up the value for it. So we should see, in, in some unknown order, you know, like it might start off with roll, it'll give us roll and then the value, and then it'll pick the next one, it might be y acceleration and give us the value. So it should print them out one after the other. So let's see, how did I decide to run it here? So we'll just type run sbet. Yep, the order is pretty crazy. It seems to not be terribly ordered by anything. That's okay, at least they're there in a nice, somewhat more readable form. So results, and then here are all of our values. So we can see here's lat degrees by name. 
So it's starting to become a little bit more usable. And this is not too far off of how I might approach working with something. You start simple and you try and build it up slowly and make sure each thing works. I'm going to show you pretty print. So if you can say from pprint import pprint, and this is unfortunate that the module and the function inside the module are the same name. I think it's bad they did this. It's confusing. But there's a pretty print module called pprint, and inside of it is a function called pprint for pretty print. And we want that function. We now have a pretty print function, and you can say pprint and sonar freak table. Oh, so I have that in there because you guys don't. OK, never mind. We're going to use pretty print, and it will look better than that. So we'll go up to the top. And it's always good to add all of your imports in one place at the top. So from pprint import pprint. So now we're going to go ahead and change our decode function to return that. And we're going to do the print from the main. We, our decode function shouldn't be printing to the screen. It should just be building a dictionary and giving you back a dictionary that you decide what you want to do with. Having your decode print everything is really inflexible. and We want to be able to do something with that data, like make a KML. So we just want the dictionary back. So we're going to work towards that. And the key thing is we are going to go down here and change the last couple lines. So if we go scroll down our, to our decode, we're going to delete from the print results, four key and the print of each line. Delete those, control W. OK, there we go. So it's gone. And we want return sbet values. You don't need the comment that's after it that's down here. That's just helping us out. So if we do that, it's going to, instead of printing out the dictionary, it's going to return it back, and we can then use it in our main function. So now our main function needs to get improved so we do something with the return. So before we just called decode, we actually want to deal with what comes back. So we'll say datagram, which is what, how people tend to refer to a packet of data from a sonar or a sensor. So datagram equals decode. We'll use that pprint on datagram. So we could have done print datagram. It would have worked, but it would be kind of ugly. And so let's try and run that and see what happens. So we'll say run sbet. And if you look, it's actually not that bad. It's fairly similar to what we did before. There's a little bit different formatting in pprint than we did with that for loop. But they've tried to make pprint sort of for things like this that are big lists. It kind of helps you out making them nicer. And it actually looks like it's ordered them, which is nice. It looks like they're in alphabetical order. So it's a little bit easier to find your stuff. If we'd wanted to sort them ourselves, we could have. It just would, you know, 10 lines of code later, we've done the equivalent of pprint. Pretty print is a good, good little function to have up your sleeve when you're doing with uh, Python data structures, like dictionaries and lists and stuff like that. It'll help you view the data without being clobbered by just things that wrap around all the lines that are hard to read. So we're actually getting, we're getting along pretty good. Unfortunately, we're out of time for today. So we're going to keep going. We're going to turn this function into something that we can use where we can pick any datagram. Right now, we're just reading that first one. We're stuck going from 0 through the first 17. And what we want to be able to do is grab any datagram out of there. And we also want to be able to figure out how many datagrams are in the file and then walk across all of them and start doing something interesting with them, like make a KML and load it up into QGIS and Google Earth. Because you, what you'd really like to be able to do with this down the road is build up an SBET thing that could, you could run it, and it would then tell you where the ship was. You know, maybe you've got a directory full of 10,000 SBET files from the last couple of years of cruises. You could then write a little script that went through all those and made a summary of where each ship went and how long it spent surveying and you know, its coverage. Once you get through all this, it actually is really powerful.